So 2023 is going to be capped off with one of the best boxing cards of the year and one of the best boxing cards that we've had in a very long time. So it's called a Day of Reckoning. And obviously, um, there's been several good fights that's actually on this card. So just to name them off the top of the card to the bottom of the card. In fact, I'll probably start with the bottom of the card until the top of the card. So obviously, th this is going to happen um, this, this weekend. And um, it's meant to be almost like an eliminator for a super fight. It's ironic that we call it an, an eliminator because um, neither of the two fighters are going to be fighting for a title when they do fight. And obviously, that's Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua. Neither one of them actually has a title. The people that have the title is obviously Usyk and um, Tyson Fury. So it, it's funny that this is almost seen as an eliminator because um, neither of the combatants, the main combatants that are going to fight later in March if they get past their respective tests, are fighting for a title. So just to put it into perspective, um, the first card that's on the the first fight that's on the card is Philip Hergovic versus Mark De, De, Demori. Now, Philip Hergovic should easily get past Mark Demori. We already remember Mark Demori. Um, he's the guy that got stopped by David Hay, and obviously that was several years ago. Uh, Philip Hergovic is seen as one of the most significant. Um, heavyweight contenders and is on the top 10 of the heavyweight division. Now, to put it into perspective, even though it's a contentious decision, he got a win over, um, obviously, Zhang. And uh, Zhang has obviously beaten Joy Joyce. So he's he's obviously a significant player within the heavyweight division. Now, a lot of people thought that Zhang actually beat Filip Pergovic. But the fact that he was competitive with a top five heavyweight shows you that uh, Philip Hergovic is not to be um, is not to be screwed around with. I mean, he's a significant fighter within the heavyweight division. He's definitely uh, deserves to be in the top ten. Then you got the next fight, which is uh, Frank Sanchez versus Jonathan Junior Far. Now Frank Sanchez is unbeaten in twenty three fights, um, and uh, and his best win is against FA Jagba. Now um, Frank Sanchez is is a significant fighter. He's a dark horse within. Um, boxing circles and um like he, he's a dark horse of the heavyweight division nobody wants to fight this guy um because he's a fighter that's uh, very good but you don't you're not going to get any recognition from beating him because the public in general just doesn't know him but his fight against junior far he should beat him um but he's a significant player within the heavyweight division he's he, i think he should definitely be within the top 10 not in the top five because he's not beating anyone but definitely the top 10 creeping on the top 10 so maybe top 12 11 maybe 10 maybe 9 but he's definitely on the on the um on uh, creeping within the top 10 and if he can get an um, opportunity against one of the top fighters he could easily climb to the top obviously he's cuban so he's very well scored the next opponent that we got is um Arsalan Makhmadov versus Ajay Kabayel. Now, we already know uh, Makhmadov is one of the most fiercest men in the heavyweight division with 17 knockouts from 18 fights. So this guy's a powerhouse. He's going in there against Ajay Kabayel. Now, Kaj Kabayel's best win is against uh, Derek Chisora. Um, but since then, he's not really had a significant win since. So obviously, just looking at it, even though these aren't the most significant fights on the card, th th this day of reckoning card is all about the heavyweights. That's what it's about. It's about... Um, clearing the, the way for the heavyweight division because for the longest time the rest of boxing has moved on like you've had of unification bouts with the likes of Terence Crawford and uh, Errol Spence you've got Inui unifying divisions but the heavyweight division for some reason is just not having to move on so this card as a whole it's just been used as a way to get the heavyweight division moving forward by any means necessary. This is what they want to do. They want to get the heavyweight division moving because the heavyweight division in general has just been very inactive. So this card in general is trying to jumpstart the heavyweight division and obviously, hopefully, um, Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua get past their tests because if they do get past their tests, then hopefully they can fight each other in March and that could really get the heavyweight division moving. And obviously, we've got the unification bout with Usek versus Tyson Fury on the way, which can obviously get things moving. So just to say it, Arsenal... This is a very good Arsalan Beck. This is a very good um, card for him to show his skills. The problem is he's going in there against Ajit Kabayel. Now, Ajit Kabayel is a mover. He's a spoiler. He's the type of opponent it's hard to look good against. That's why Derek Chisora struggled and lost against him. With Arsalan Beck, I think he's going to struggle with Ajit Kabayel's movement because he's very cagey. He's not going to engage. When a power puncher goes in there with somebody who's cagey, they definitely over commit and they... they they're not going to perform as well as an opponent coming at them. So I could see this as a tricky fight for Arsene Beck, but it's a good test for his career at this point in time. And um, 
in a weird way, it's a bit of a hard, weird fight for him because to be on this card, you want to look impressive because the world's media is going to be looking at you. Maybe his management was wrong to put him in against Ajay Kabiel. Even though Ajay Kabiel has not had a significant win since the Derek Chisora fight, he's a spoiler. He's an opponent that's difficult to look good against. So maybe it's not a good thing to put them put put them two together because if you're Arslan Beck's uh, management, you want him to look good on such a world stage. Why put him in there against an opponent that's, that he's not going to look good against stylistically? I don't know. It's a bit of a head scratcher. But if you can get him out of there, if you can knock him out or get him hurt or stop him or beat him, then that's a very good um, scalp that he's got on his record. So, And he's going in there against an op- opponent that's not easy to look good against. So that's another thing that will be good for his career. Because it's good to go in there against styles that you're not comfortable with, especially early in a career. If you want to build your character, you want to build your um, skill set, it's good to go in there against opponents that you're not comfortable with. So, yeah, that's what I think about that. So, the next one, obviously, Jai Apataya, but Ellis Zoro. Again, this is a bit of a gimme fight. Apataya is obviously, um, uh, I think he's dropped the IBF belt because he wants to make money by fighting Ellis Zoro because the IBF wouldn't let him take this fight because he needs to, um, uh, he wants to go in there against a different mandatory that the IBF want him to fight but I think he's good that he's going for the money because he could easily get the IBF belt back because of his talent and he might not get the money again so why why turn that money down uh Zorro um honest to god I mean he he's really going up against it I mean uh, Jay Apataya looks like one of the most significant fighters like special talents within the cruiserweight um cruiserweight title picture especially as everyone else has moved up like the likes of the U6 of the world he looks like the future so I think he should get past Ellis Zorro quite easily the next fight is very interesting Daniel Dubois versus Gerald Miller now I like Daniel Dubois as a person I actually do like him and I like his um story but I think he's going in there against Gerald Miller who's um who just seems like an absolute monster like his size his mass it's not so much his skills but his mass um, provides, and it's not just that, it's the way he carries himself. Like this guy is, is is known to be a bit of a dirty fighter. He's known as a bit of an alpha bully type character. You've seen the way he confronted Eddie Hearn. You've seen the way he confronted um, Anthony Joshua. And you saw the way he um, confronted Daniel Dubois as well. So th- th- this guy, this guy's overbearing. He's insufferable and he's in your face. And I feel like the way he acts outside of the ring is quite similar to the way he acts inside the ring in terms of his style. This guy's going to come at you. And I um, I hate to say it, but I think Daniel Dubois is going to struggle here because um, he's going up against a guy that's got so much mass. He's undefeated. He's arrogant. He's um, he's he's a bit of a dirty fight, you can say, because of his uh, drug scandals, allegedly. Well, not allegedly because he's been caught. But anyway, my point is this. Um, he seems like he's someone who would do anything to win. So I actually think uh, Jarrell Miller might... Um, I- I'll go into it in depth when I make a video about this, but um, this is a very good fight, very 50-50 fight. Daniel Dubois can't afford the loss because obviously he's coming off a lock- loss against Usyk. And before that, obviously he lost to Joy Joyce. Um, but I think Jarrell Miller could potentially give him a loss just because of his attitude, the way he carries himself, his mass. I mean... His work rate. I know he's probably off steroids at this point in time because he's been tested so many times. Um, and obviously, he, he's not as dynamic as Daniel Dubois, but I just feel like the way he's carrying himself, his arrogance, and he's on the world stage, he doesn't seem intimidated. I think Daniel Dubois is going to have his hands full in this fight. That's just my opinion. Next fight, Dimitri Bivol versus Lyndon Arthur. Very good fight. Um, I think it's a very good fight, but it's not a great fight. Um, Lyndon Arthur is a good fighter. I mean, he, he's. I wouldn't say he's the most elite, but um, obviously he beat Anthony Yard. Anthony Yard's a decent fighter. He's given very good fights against the likes of Sergei Kovalev and um, Arta Bertabiev. But truth be told, um, I, I don't know, Lyndon Arthur, I think he can give some difficulty to Bivol because of his range and his size and his jab and the way he carries himself. But I think Bivol should win this. Bivol's obviously made 15 defences of his title. He's a top 10 pound for pound fighter. He's a guy that beat Canelo. I mean... Bivol should be able to win this, but I think that in the early rounds and the first couple of rounds, it's going to be a bit tricky because Lyndon Arthur is a bit of a tricky fighter with his jab and his range and the way he carries himself. But I think Bivol should win that. The next fight, Deontay Wilder versus Joseph Parker. Very interesting fight this is. Um, This is a fight that I think um, Joseph Parker's got the talent to win, physical gifts to win. He can move around, he can box, he's got fast hands. He was a champion before, so this probably one of the best opponents that he's fought, apart from Tyson Fury, for Deontay Wilder. But Deontay, the one crux against Joseph Parker is, 
on the start, highest stage when everyone is watching, he doesn't seem to be mean enough and he doesn't seem to grab the moment, seize the moment, try to win, try to make it happen. Uh, while Deontay Wilder, say what you like about him, he does, um, he might not have the most ability, he might not have the most speed, but he never holds anything back. He's got a lot of heart. He's going to come for it and he's going to cut come for it he's gonna come try ripping your head off he's not gonna um be a fighter that's like um gonna get timid under the bright lights he's someone who's gonna put it all on the ring we've seen him do that several times in the tyson fury fight even in the second fight when he was getting an absolute shellacking from tyson fury he still didn't want to quit and he still wanted to continue going forward it shows you the testament to his character and i feel like even though joseph parker's more talented technically a better fighter in terms of his hand speed and such and are just more well-rounded and got more better boxing ability um the problem with him is that um on the biggest stage he doesn't tend to seem to perform like we've seen it against anti joshua i'm not saying he bottled it but he didn't perform as good as he should have we've seen it against um uh against um dillian white again he didn't perform at his absolute best um, but Deontay Wilder, say what you want about him, against the opposition that he's fought against, even when he lost against the likes of Tyson Fury, he did perform in the sense that he never quit. He's always going to go for it and he sees the moment. Many times he dropped Tyson Fury. So, yeah, I think um, Josie Parker should win this with his technical ability. But then Deontay Wilder's got more will, even though he doesn't have as much skill as Joseph Parker. He se tends to seize the moment and he tends to go for it. While Joseph Parker seems more placid and passive. Um, obviously, we've got Anthony Joshua versus Otto Wallin. Now, if it was a couple of years ago when Anthony Joshua was fire, firing on all cylinders, I think he would have beaten Otto Wallin. But this is a different Anthony Joshua. Anthony Joshua is still dealing with the demons and remnants of his um, his uh, fights against the likes of um, with the likes of uh, the two losses against Usek and obviously his loss against Ruiz on the world stage in America. So, with that being said, Otto Wallin has fought him three times, so he's quite familiar with Anthony Joshua. Obviously, Anthony Joshua has beaten him every time, but Otto Wallin's a game fighter. Obviously, when he fought Tyson Fury, he gave him absolute hell. He, he got a stitch over his eye, and when his eye was cut, he was rubbing it with his gloves. He was, he's a guy that's going to go for it, and um, he seems super confident going into this fight. Um, so, looking into it, um, Anthony Joshua should win this, but I would, not be, I would not be surprised if Otto Wallin gives him a difficult time, just like Hellenius did in his last fight. Before Anthony Joshua got him out of there, he did look a bit unspectacular and didn't look as... um. He didn't look as explosive and spectacular. He looked very circumspect and um, um, tentative. Um, Otto Wellin, I think, can do that to him. But then Anthony Joshua should win. I hope he wins because I want to see him fight Deontay Wilder in March. So I've done a run-through of the main fights on the card. Tell me what you think. Um, just my general run-through. I'm going to make separate videos about um, some of these fights so that we can get something going. And um, from there, we'll see what happens. Uh, this is going to be a very good card for the end of the year and i think 2023 has been a very good year for boxing tell me what you think below and uh like and subscribe to the channel i've got a lot more content coming your way peace